So I was asked to present at the first annual Learn to Adjust conference in Hearst, Texas back in January of 2019. It was a great honor to be asked to join a distinguished group of industry experts in talking about property claims to the attendees. In this video, I talk with Angela Henderson, founder of the adjuster learning site and blog, learntoadjust.com, about how to be selective when looking for training how to expand your adjuster skills outside of formal training, and how to keep your license up to date with free continuing education credits. And we're starting right now. This is Adjuster TV. Hey, it's Matt here with Adjuster TV. For the best tips and tools for getting on the first call list as a cap property independent adjuster, subscribe now. Click on the bell notification and bada bing, bada boom. I recently received a question from Jay who asks, I'm a bit worried. Just when I'm getting ready and buying gear to start a new career, I keep hearing about this mobile technology that a lot of car insurance companies are using. No adjuster involvement, just the insured taking pictures themselves. Do you think that it will spread to homes as well and that it will start cutting out adjusters? Thank you as always for all the info you give. Thanks for watching Jay. And to get people up to speed on what Jay's asking, if you have a claim on your car, these days some insurance companies will allow you, the insured, to take photos of the damage and send that in instead of them sending an adjuster out to take those photos. Jay is concerned that just when he's getting excited to start an incredible new career that seems to have so much potential to change his life for the better, that he'll have missed the boat. The salad days will be a memory. And he will have wasted a bunch of money and a bunch of time preparing for a job that just doesn't exist anymore. I totally get it, and even the chance that this could happen is enough to scare even me. But I don't think it's the case. And to understand why I say that, I think it's important to understand what carriers are trying to accomplish when an insured files a claim, whether it's auto, or property, or anything else. The relationship between the insurance company and the insured is pretty simple. The insured pays a premium every month, and the carrier promises to take on a certain level of risk. Risk that if the insured took it on themselves would represent financial hardship or ruin if it happened to the insured. So for example, fire. If it would cost $250,000 to rebuild your home if it burned down and you didn't have insurance, would you be able to pay for that on your own? Probably not for most people. So you basically pay what amounts to a subscription to a company who says, in exchange for the subscription fee, we will pay to replace your home if it burns down, right? Everything else associated with claims handling is just a tool to facilitate that relationship between the carrier and their customer, the insured. It's a relationship based on a promise and nothing more but promises require trust, right? So what are the tools that carriers use to carry out this promise? They can use in-house claims team, and if the in-house claims team can't handle a volume of claims or claims that are remote, then they'll hire independent contractors to help them out, which is us, the independent adjuster. That's our world in a nutshell. So let's talk a little bit about what carriers are ultimately trying to do with things like photo-assisted claims, using an unlicensed subcontractor, claims where the insured submits photos with no field adjuster, or even a direct repair contractor that takes the place of a field adjuster. The carriers will always have a desk adjuster working a claim. There's always an adjuster somewhere in there. In non-CAT situations, it's up to that desk adjuster to decide how he or she wants to handle it. The options that they currently have available are the insured sends in a photo of the damage or like on a FaceTime, and the adjuster writes the estimate based on those photos and the insured's measurements, understanding that when a contractor shows up, things might change. Number two, they can call one of their restoration contractor partners who's agreed to abide by the carrier's estimating guidelines, and they will act as the field adjuster. Number three, they can go out on the claim themselves and handle the claim on site. As a rule, this option will have the best customer service outcome. And number four, if none of the above options are appropriate or feasible, they can send the claim out to an independent adjuster who will scope and write up the claim and send it back in for further processing by the desk adjuster. And that's mainly for daily. On CAT, it's a little bit different. Regular staff adjusters generally won't be making those decisions. If a storm or other large scale event occurs, all claims from that event will be routed to the catastrophe claims department and they'll decide based on the number of policies that may have been affected, how many adjusters to send. Many carriers have their own CAT teams and don't hire IAs, but many more will supplement their staff CAT teams with independent adjusters. And just as a reminder, the absolute best customer experience is to have a trained, licensed adjuster on site, making the coverage decision and settling with the insured. Everybody agrees on that 
from the carrier on down. But here's where the controversy comes in. There are other factors that make this a little bit more of a complicated decision for the carrier. So you have the added cost of bringing in IAs, not as big of a deal as you might think, but a consideration nonetheless. Also, they have to consider the, the laws of the state. A big part of fair claims requires that claims be handled in a timely manner. Fines and other penalties can occur otherwise, as well as how well the customer was treated initially. If you are well-trained, licensed, and can close a lot of claims in a short period of time without losing file quality and while maintaining a wonderful experience for the customer, even on CAT, or especially on CAT, you will never have to worry about making a great living at this job. This year, 15 years from now, 40 years from now. Why? Because as I said above, insurance is a relationship based on a promise. And the carriers have known pretty much from day one, 150 years ago, that the best way to keep customers and get new ones is to give them a top shelf on-site settlement where they only have to deal with one adjuster. Doesn't matter if it's counter daily, staff or IA. But it's, so is photo assist a bad thing? No, it's not. In fact, it's a great way to get into the industry. Do IA firms want to only send out photo assist people? Absolutely not. They'll go out of business if they can't send out highly trained licensed adjusters able to make coverage decisions and close claims. We call them standalone adjusters, right? So don't anybody blame IA firms for photo assist. Do carriers want to send out only photo assist people? Again, no, they don't. Customer retention is one of their most important goals. And if a customer feels like they've been treated like a number, if the person who came out for their $35,000 hail claim couldn't answer any questions, if their claim has to be reinspected and supplemented, what's gonna happen? That customer is going to switch and they'll badmouth their old carrier any chance they get. Carriers don't want that more than anything. So how do you make a career as a highly paid and sought after independent adjuster? You close a lot of claims with great quality. You have to think in terms of volume, but only where it serves peak quality and peak customer service. If you can do that, you'll be golden. And just a little inside baseball for you, this job isn't rocket science, okay? You don't need an engineering degree from MIT to be good at this job and to get noticed. You can distinguish yourself by putting, at a minimum, even just 10% more effort into your cycle time, your file quality, and your customer service. If you do that, you'll find yourself among the top 15 or 20% of adjusters. Busy. Put in even more effort, and it's just not that hard to get up into the top 5% of adjusters and be on the first call list of every roster you're on. In other words, you're going to be valuable. And speaking of making yourself more valuable, let's talk to Angela Henderson at Learn to Adjust about getting started, building your adjuster skill set, and free continuing education credits. Here's Angela. My name is Angela Henderson, and I am the, I guess, owner, proprietor of a blog site called Learn to Adjust, and it is a site that I created um, looking for a presence, kind of a friendly adjuster presence online when I started working in property insurance. And so Learn to Adjust is a blog site on Facebook, but we've also recently developed a website. Um, it's turning into a learning management platform. Uh, right now there's uh, videos and things that are available for sale, classes and things on the Learn to Adjust website, but we're developing that into a whole platform where people can go and learn more about how to get into adjusting. And then once you're into adjusting, it's giving you step-by-step -step kind of footprint so you can develop your skill set and kind of advance your career. We are actually here today for a conference that we held. It's going to be an annual event. It's being held in Hearst, Texas, and we had the best results. Um, we had a property track and an Xactimate Level 1 training track where we had adjusters come out, learn more about property adjusting from the desk perspective. We talked a lot about damage, recognizing signs of damage um, with exterior inspections for those who are interested in field adjusting. And then Stephen Harmon was our guest speaker who also spent the day training new adjusters on Xactimate Level 1. He gave out his basically uh, normal certification training platform and program uh, for free to our adjusters who, who attended here. So it was a really well received and well attended event. New people have questions. I mean, you're you obviously you're a blog site dedicated to helping new people get started, mm -hmm. learn to adjust. Um, any maybe advice from like a training standpoint you could think of for new people? Like for new people? That? Sure, sure. So for new people looking to get into the industry, um, first just be careful about how you get your initial training coming into the industry. There are several platforms you can um, utilize. You can 
you can, if you are um, pretty good at learning and picking things up quickly, you can learn online. And then if you need some kind of hands-on, one-on-one classroom training, you want to look for an environment that's going to give you some really good feedback, an opportunity to network, but also give you the education that you need to learn what you need to do to pass your last licensing exam for whatever state that you're going to get licensed in. And then once you have that exam uh, kind of under your belt, you want to use those resources that you developed in your training course to be able to move forward and find other avenues for training. So for example, a lot of people are either, either working as contractors or some type of restoration specialist or what have you, and they decide to get their adjuster's license to be able to work independently and make more money. And so those same people that you meet can provide you with training resources that you don't normally see online. A lot of times you'll see people kind of recirculating the same old schools <laughs> online that may or may not be as effective um, for what you need. And I found that the best training resources are the ones that you kind of find for yourself. So um, like I said, Learn to Adjust is going to have a learning management platform available for users very soon. But until that happens, there's all kinds of resources. Um, as an example, if you're looking for uh, training and continuing education, most adjusters don't know this, but you could go to um, like a Serve Pro, Service Master, and they actually will offer CE courses for free. They love having adjusters come in. All you have to do is schedule some time uh, to dedicate to this kind of training, sign up on their website, and they're going to give you some type of two to three hour to four hour class on restoration techniques that allow you to continue your education and kind of build on the knowledge that you already have in addition to get your CE credits. So these are all kinds of resources available. I didn't know that. <laughs> okay. That's awesome. Angela Henderson, I'm a principal with Learn to Adjust, which is a blog site and web-based learning platform. And you're watching Adjuster TV. All right, question of the day. You probably know what a turtle vent is, but do you know what else is required for proper roof ventilation? Answer in the comments below where you're watching this video. And for much more information about getting started as an independent adjuster, check out adjustertv.com. And if you got value from this video, you can help me create more videos just like this by pressing this round subscribe button. And there's plenty more where this came from. Check out these videos. And as always, thank you so much for watching and have a great storm. Good idea, let's get in it. Wait, you can't drive through this. Why not? Because you're going to get splashed. Uh -huh. <gasps> Matthew, what are you doing?